Today, I want to talk about how the pandemic COVID-19 has affected corporate finance in the United States. Uh, as we speak, a large number of especially small corporations uh, are struggling to manage their finances. Uh, and what I want to show you is a set of initial results that help us understand what has actually driven their precautionary demand for cash and what I'm going to call as, in fact, a dash for cash. An important factor seems to be that they are worried about a further deterioration of their balance sheets and finances, uh, which I'm going to refer to as the risk of becoming a fallen angel. This work is joined with Sasha Steffen at Frankfurt School. So let me to set things uh, uh, on, a, on a level playing field in our understanding, define a simple way of understanding how might firms be managing their finances. So I look at the balance sheet of firms and construct a ratio that I'm going to call as the liquidity of the firm. So what is the liquidity of a firm's balance sheet? A firm has some unused credit lines, which it can draw down upon from its banks. The firm has some cash and short-term investments that are easy to liquidate in the markets. And so they are an immediate source of financing. And these have to be measured relative to the immediate cash needs of the firms from a financial sense, this would be the proportion of the firm's debt, which is short term. So liquidity is this unused credit lines plus cash and short term investments net of the short term debt. And in order to make the measure comparable across firms, we have to scale it by a measure of the size of the firm, which is its total assets. Now, on the left hand side of the plot, uh, if you look at how the liquidity behaved over the last uh, 15 months uh, until the end of quarter 2020, uh, 15 months uh, ending then, you can see that liquidity actually declined uh, over this period. But importantly, since the outbreak of the COVID in the first quarter of 2020, there is a shift in how this liquidity is being provided for by firms. And you can see at the bottom of the plot that short-term debt to assets has risen. So firms are becoming more indebted. The firms are relying more on cash to assets and their undrawn portions of credit lines are coming down. This implies that firms are drawing down their credit lines not being able to replenish their stock of undrawn credit lines at the same pace, but that these drawing down activity is adding to the precautionary buffers of cash on the balance sheet of firms. Sometimes this is referred to as cash being king when you get a large aggregate shock to the economy. Now the question is, why are the firms doing this? First, I want to show you on the right hand side plot that this activity is being rewarded in the market. So using the measure of liquidity, we divide firms into low liquidity firms and high liquidity firms. And starting on 1st January 2020, the plot on the right hand side shows you the stock return differential between the low and the high liquidity firms. The firms with low liquidity have underperformed the high liquidity firms by as much as 10 percentage points of their stock returns. So clearly the firms are doing this in the interest of shareholder value. Now, which firms are doing what? At what stage of the pandemic? And what has been the impact of the policy measures? Have the policy measures reached some of the firms that are perhaps in the greatest need of cash in such times. And I'll show you some descriptive evidence that helps answer these questions. Now, uh, focusing on this pattern that cash reserves have been constructed by drawing down on bank credit lines, what you see first on the left-hand side plot is that firms have drawn down historically the most intense level of bank credit line drawdowns ever in history. In a short period of three months, 
uh, large firms in the United States drew down more than $330 billion of credit lines. If you included smaller firms, these estimates are in excess of half a trillion. Now, why is this unprecedented and large? Because if you thought of the Great Recession, uh, the one that followed the global financial crisis as being a period of severe stress and used it to benchmark these drawdowns, what we observed in three months of the pandemic is what we would have expected to occur over the entire year. So the early phase of the pandemic was one of heightened aggregate risk, heightened uncertainty, and an extreme precautionary behavior. On the right-hand side, let me explain certain patterns of these extreme precautionary behavior. The vertical line represents the Federal Reserve's announcement to support the corporate bond markets. Until this announcement, even the AAA rated and all the other investment grade rated firms were drawing down heavily on their credit lines, implying that the precautionary desire was not just with the weaker rated corporations, but also amongst some of the best rated corporations in the United States. An important impact of the Federal Reserve policy was to put a floor on the drawdowns by the highest rated firms. Nevertheless, as you see in the top lines, that the non-investment grade and the unrated firms have continued to draw down on their credit lines, albeit at a slower pace since April of 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. Now, let's understand why, therefore, these patterns are important. As I mentioned, the investment grade firms are the ones who are benefiting most from the policy support measures. In particular, the Federal Reserve has intervened substantially to buy these corporate bonds directly in the market, but mostly so for the higher rated categories. Now you can see on the left hand side that the cumulative bond issuances by AAA to A rated firms and triple B rated firms, collectively, these are the investment grade rated firms, spiked significantly following the Federal Reserve announcement of support. However, the rise in bond issuance is relatively muted for the non investment grade firms. Furthermore, even the issuances that are being undertaken by the non investment grade firms are at significantly higher costs. This can be seen on the right-hand side plot, where you can see that the issuances are at higher yields relative to the investment grade category for the sub-investment grade bonds. And this differential is in fact rising even after the policy measures have been put in place. Now, one way of interpreting these results is that even within the investment grade firms, those which are right at the cusp, meaning the most risky triple B rated firms, face a substantial cliff risk of becoming a fallen angel and entering the non-investment grade category. The question then is, are these firms also risk averse and precautionary in their holdings of cash? And perhaps even more so than some of the other non-investment grade firms, because the downgraded firms have already jumped over the cliff, whereas the, the risky triple B rated firms are trying to avoid the cliff risk of becoming a fallen angel. Now, to look at this, we look at three exercises. First, on the left hand side, we are showing you the performance in the market of the highest rated investment grade firms, triple B rated investment firms, and the non-investment grade firms, or what are called as the junk rated firms. And what you observe very strikingly is that firms which are at the cusp of investment grade, which is in the, in the middle dashed line, they have not done that much better in terms of being rewarded or punished by the stock markets than the non-investment grade firms. This perhaps reflects that the market too recognizes their cliff risk of becoming a fallen angel. Second exercise, which is on the right-hand side of the plot here, is that 
you can see that firms which got downgraded from triple B category, which is just above investment grade into the double B category to become a junk rated firm. I'm going to refer to these firms as fallen angels. They have been substantially punished by the stock market in their valuations. You can see that the differential between the thick black line, which represents these fallen angels, and the dashed line, which represents the triple B rated firms, is in fact as high as 25 to 30% of the stock return. This suggests that the triple B rated firms face a very significant limitation in terms of their stock valuation, perhaps access to the credit markets, and at a minimum in their costs of borrowing were they to get downgraded to the junk status. Now, this point is rather important because estimates suggest that perhaps about 34% of these triple B rated firms at the cusp of investment grade to junk category are perhaps somewhat inflated in their ratings, which is that if you constructed a measure of their credit risk purely based on balance sheet fundamentals and market valuations, you would attribute that several of these firms should perhaps have already been rated as non-investment grade firms. Now, using this idea, you can construct a measure of downgrade vulnerability in the triple B rated category. Which firms are most at the risk of becoming a fallen angel? And have they increased their borrowings by drawing down their credit lines, either to avoid a downgrade or to avoid the associated steep increase in the borrowing costs and both? What we find is that if you match the triple B rated firms, which are downgrade vulnerable, to similar double B rated firms, which are already fallen angels. So if you compare those which are most vulnerable to those which have already become fallen angels, you find that surprisingly, these triple B rated firms actually drew down 88% more of their credit lines than what are already downgraded firms, suggesting that they are indeed concerned about the cliff risk of becoming a fallen angel. So let me summarize. What has the early evidence of from data on the US companies taught us about corporate cash behavior during a pandemic? First, in times of heightened aggregate risk, such as the pandemic, cash has again re-emerged as the king for the corporate treasurers. Cash has dominated even what are extremely high quality bank lines of credit. Second, while policy interventions have succeeded in that they have dampened the supremacy of cash in the highest rated corporations, this is not yet true of the weaker rated corporations of the economy. Many of these companies tend to be small and this needs to be kept in mind when the transmission of policy to the real side of the economy is being considered. And last, we perhaps learn a deeper message about what shapes the corporate cash holdings. Uh, many have attributed it to purely precautionary behavior. Some have attributed it to simply a waste of resources by uh, uh, large companies that want to build bigger and bigger empires. But what COVID uh, episode has taught us is that credit risk is actually also a rather important determinant of corporate cash holdings. And presently, we face tons of such credit risk for our corporate balance sheets. Importantly, the corporate desire for cash seems to be driven not just by the actual transition to defaulting on liabilities, but even some intermediate thresholds. In particular, the cliff risk of switching from investment grade to junk rated category seems to be driving a significant proportion of the desire to save and preserve uh, corporate cash on the balance sheets of United States corporations.